Hey guys, Dr. Best here coming with another fantastic chemistry video. And today we're going to talk about acids and bases. Let's get into it. All right, guys, Arrhenius acids. Now, these are just definitions of acids, okay? Arrhenius acids are substances that dissociate in water to give you hydronium ions. Essentially, they make H plus in water, okay? Now, Arrhenius acids is just a way of looking at acids. Now, there's Arrhenius, there's Bronsted, and there's Lewis, right? So these are all acids, and they're all basically behaving in a similar way. All right, they're all kind of similar. Now, an Arrhenius acid generates hydronium in water. A Bronsted and Lowry, oh, let me go back real quick to that um, to make sure we're all good here. Um, this is hydronium right here, H3O+. That is what gives you the proton in water, right? You have to have hydronium. So this is the acid. This is the base. This is the conjugate acid. And this is the conjugate base, okay? That's how it works. That's how it goes in this system. All right, these are Arrhenius acids there, give you hydronium and water. Now, an Arrhenius base gives you hydroxide and water, OH minus, gives you hydroxide and water. That's an Arrhenius base. Along comes Bronsted and Lowry. Bronsted and Lowry said, how about we define an acid and a base as a proton donor acceptor pair, where the acid is the proton donor, the base is the proton acceptor, okay? The acid is the proton donor, the base is the proton acceptor, and that's how it goes. All right? Now, again, acid, base, conjugate uh, acid, conjugate base. This, the chloride would be the conjugate base. Acid, base, conjugate base, conjugate acid. Acid, base, conjugate acid, uh, conjugate base, conjugate acid. Okay. Acid, base, conjugate base, conjugate acid. That's how it works. You should know this from general chemistry, I hope. So here are some more conjugate acid base pairs. Acid, base, conjugate base, conjugate acid. Acid, base, conjugate base, conjugate acid. Now it's not always written that way. Sometimes the acid's written first. Just keep that in mind. Okay, now as the bond to H becomes more polarized, H becomes more positive and the bond becomes easier to break. So, fluorine is more electronegative, electronegative than oxygen. So that means F minus is more stable than OH minus as an anion. OH minus is more stable than NH2 minus as an anion. NH2 is more stable than CH3 minus. Okay? So that means because F minus is more stable than OH minus, HF is a stronger acid than water. Water is a stronger acid than ammonia. Ammonia is a stronger acid than methane. Okay, now let me just fix this real quick. Uh, let me do it this way. Let me just push this up a little bit. There we go. So now that means that fluoride is not a very good base compared to OH. OH is a much better base than fluoride. Although NH2 is a stronger base than OH minus. CH3 is better than all of them. It's a very good base. It wants to rip protons off of almost anything. Okay. So that's how it works. As things become more stable, F minus, for example, it becomes less basic. Now, stable just means it's not as reactive. doesn't mean it's non-reactive. I didn't say it was inert. I just said it was more stable, which means it's less reactive. Okay? So if you put fluoride and OH hydroxide in a solution together, and they were all going after one proton, hydroxide would get it first because hydroxide is more reactive. Okay? Now, size. Fluoride, however, is less acidic. Sorry, HF is less acidic than HI. HI is more acidic. Now, this has to do with size. As the size of the anion increases, it, the acid becomes more acidic. So these bonds here on HI are very weak because of the overlapping of the orbital of the S orbital of hydrogen to the P orbital of the iodine. The P orbital the iodine is using is much larger than the P orbital the F is using. So the orbital overlap with F is a lot better because the overlapping orbital is, is more efficient. You get a better bond. So therefore the bond is stronger and therefore the acid is less um, acidic. Say it like that. All right. Now let's talk about the effects of resonance on pKa. Now hopefully you guys all know Hopefully that you guys all know. Oops, sorry. Let me fix this, guys. I had a rough, rough video today, guys. 
Let me move me out of the way. There we go. Now, the effects of resonance on Ka. Now, remember K, pKa is a measurement of acidity. Now, the lower the pKa, the more acidic an acid is. The higher the pKa, the less acidic. So here's a pKa of basically 16, 15.9. Here's a pKa of 4.7. Here's one of negative 1.2. So this is our strongest acid. This is our strongest acid. Now, why is that important? Well, notice how this anion can resonate. To give us this ion. That ion can also resonate. to give us this ion. So notice we're getting one, two, three resonance forms where the anion can resonate to three different oxygens, putting the negative charge on three different oxygens, spreading that delta negative around, making this a more stable, less reactive anion. And in fact, this anion is so stable, it's not considered basic. Because as you can see over here, this is a strong acid. Strong acids dissociate completely in water, so therefore the conjugate base should not be acidic. Or sorry, the conjugate base should not be basic, pardon me. So here's acetate. Now you can see acetate can resonate, but it can only resonate to one other oxygen, not two others, right? So there's only two oxygens that can share the negative charge. So that hybrid structure will look something like this. Oops. Okay, so that's what the hybrid structure would look like for that particular acid. Notice here, we can share the negative charge, negative charge with three different oxygens. Here we can only change it, exchange it with two. Notice the pKa difference is dramatic. Negative 1.2 all the way to almost five. Now remember, pKa numbers are magnitudes, so they're logarithmic. So one order of magnitude is 10 times more acidic. So here we have about six times, so six times 10, or 10, 10 to the sixth power difference in uh, acidity. So it's dramatic difference in acidity. Now here's an example of an anion that doesn't resonate at all. So the negative charge is stuck on one oxygen. So it won't resonate. And notice the pKa is huge compared to this. It's a very huge pKa. Now you have to understand that in an acid-base chemistry, an acid-base chemistry, put that up there, an acid-base chemistry, you have an acid, oops, you have HA plus water in equilibrium with hydronium plus A minus. The stability of A minus tells us how acidic HA is going to be, okay? Because basically, if you look at Ka, it's concentration of hydronium. Multiply by the concentration of A minus, divide it by the concentration of HA. Okay? If you just follow the mathematics here, the larger this number, the larger that number, because these two things are one-to-one uh, -one ratio in stoichiometry. So as this concentration builds up, this concentration builds up. These two numbers get large. As these two things become built up in concentration, this concentration diminishes. Okay? As these two things build up in concentration, this diminishes. So these numbers get big, and that number gets small. So you're going to have a large Ka. Okay? A large Ka, you'll, get a, you'll have a small pKa. All right? So let's do that again. As this increases in concentration, so does this, because it's one-to-one -one stoichiometry, this will decrease in concentration at equilibrium. Remember, this is an equilibrium, so you have to remember that. These are in equilibrium. So what does this have to do with anything? Well, if I know the stability, or I can predict the stability, or I can determine if A- minus is more stable in one reaction or another, I can predict acidity. Now, why is that important? Well, it's important to understand stability of ions, cations and anions. We're talking about anions specifically right now. It's important, it's important to be able to predict their stability. How do you do that? Resonance is the big one. 
if an anion can resonate, it will be much more stable than an, than an anion that cannot resonate. All right, so let's keep that in mind. Resonance rules. Notice, this anion, the conjugate base of methane sulfonic acid, resonates three times to oxygen. So you spread that negative charge across three oxygens. That's a very stabilizing effect. It makes methane sulfonic acid a strong acid. Why? Because this, its conjugate base, increases in concentration. So does this. They both increase. So these numbers become huge. This number, the parent acid, which in this case would be this acid right here, this number gets very small. So this equilibrium will, fire, will lie far to the right, and that is a strong acid. Okay? This particular anion can only resonate twice to oxygen, and that's it. So it's much less stable. Now, I, I'm not saying that it's um, super-duper reactive. It's not, but it's much less stable than methane sulfonic acid. Much less stable. Okay? So this, this is not basic at all. This is slightly basic. And this one that doesn't resonate at all is very basic because it wants its equilibrium to lie far to the left. It wants to go back the other way because it's not stable in water or any other protonated solvent. Okay? Now, let's talk about Lewis acids and bases. Now, a Lewis acid is anything that can accept a pair of electrons. A Lewis base is anything that can receive a pair of electrons. All right? Now, a Lewis acid accepts a pair of electrons. It's known as an electrophile. I don't want to write that word down. It's going to be around for the rest of our careers. Electrophile. A Lewis acid is an electrophile. Anything that can accept a pair of electrons in organic chemistry, we call that an electrophile. Or if you want to break the word down, electro means electrons, file means to love. So electrophile are electron loving. In other words, positive charges or delta positive charges. So if you have a sextet or if you're delta positive, you potentially could be an electrophile. Okay, Not necessarily, but potentially you could be. Now, Lewis bases, electron pair donors, those are called nucleophiles. I think we have it. There it is. Nucleophile. Nucleophile will donate electrons to a nucleus with an empty orbital or with a delta positive. Okay? It doesn't have to be empty. Nucleophiles are attracted to nuclei, nucleus. Okay? What's in the nucleus? The plus charge. Okay? Electrophiles are delta positive or positive. Nucleophiles are delta negative or negative. Okay? Nucleophiles are electron pair donors. Electrophiles are electron pair acceptors. Nucleophiles are Lewis bases. Electrophiles are Lewis acids. But in organic chemistry, we tend to stick to the terms nucleophile and electrophile. Okay? And here are some examples. Now, these are basic little mechanisms that you may want to familiarize yourself with. So here's our nucleophile. Two-headed arrow attacks the proton, which is, in this case, you could call the electrophile. Generally, you would call this an acid-base reaction, but that's okay. You can use these terms if you want to. So the Lewis base, electron pair donor. Lewis acid, electron pair acceptor. Electrons attack, the, the electrons from the nucleophile attack with a two-headed arrow, the electrophile. Here's another example. Here we have boron. Boron has a sextet here. So boron wants to form another bond. The lone pair from nitrogen attacks with a two-headed arrow, the boron. Nucleophile, electrophile. That's a bond-forming step. And you make this uh, compound or this ion or zwitter ion over here where the nitrogen and the boron now have a bond between them. Here we go. We have carbon with a delta plus charge. How do I know it's delta plus? Well, we have a chlorine attached to it. The chlorine is pulling electron density this way. So that means this carbon is somewhat positive. The negative oxygen is going to attack it. It's going to collide with it. And two-headed arrow, so from the electrons to the carbon, two-headed arrow, the chlorine leaves, giving us this ether where this bond between carbon and oxygen has been made. And the chloride is over here. Now, this is called a leaving group. A leaving group. I can do that a little neater. Sorry, guys. Make that a little prettier. A leaving group. Now, we're going to talk more about leaving groups later on in the chapters. 
But a leaving group is a anything that leaves and takes the bond electrons with it. Um, we're going to talk a lot more about this later, but in general, a good leaving group is um, a very, very, very uh, poor conjugate base. So in other words, any leaving group is the conjugate base of a strong acid. So chloride, a conjugate base of a strong acid. Bromide, iodine, iodide, conjugate bases of strong acids are good leaving groups. The halogens are great examples of them. Water is a good leaving group. Ammonia is a good leaving group. Ethers, alcohols, they all can be good leaving groups. Okay, we're going to get to that later on. We'll just know that uh, electrophile, nucleophile, leaving group. You need to know all three of those. Finally, we have, let me get me out of the way here. Ah, goodness gracious. Up you go. Hey, here we go. All right, so here we have the nucleophile. Attacks the proton, and the electrons go to the oxygen. So this is a nucleophile. The hydrogen can be considered an electrophile. And this whole group right here could be considered the leaving group. Why is that? Well, because notice the bond electrons go to that group, and that group is by itself now. Now, the leaving groups don't have to be negative. A lot of times they are, but they don't have to be. So keep that in mind. All right, and that is the end of chapter one, guys. You made it all the way through. Uh, again, it's just a very brief, quick intro, uh, review of Gen Chem and a little introduction to some organics. So I hope that was helpful to you all. Now, with that, I want to wish you all good luck and good chemistry. We'll see you soon.